My name is Gavin Cleesbees, and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Our program this evening will look at the new book, The Three-Cornered War, by Megan Kate Nelson. The book explores the connections among the Civil War, the Indian Wars, and Western expansion. Historian Nelson reframes the era as one of national conflict, involving not just the North and the South, but also the West. Against the backdrop of this larger series of battle, uh, Nelson introduces us to nine charismatic individuals who fought for self-determination and control of the region. Uh, this evening, we'll explore a handful of these stories. Megan Kate Nelson is a writer and a historian who explores the history of the Civil War, the West, popular culture, and the 19th century in general. She earned her BA in history and literature from Harvard University and her PhD in American studies from the University of Iowa. The format of the program today is that she will give a brief overview and will then be joined by MHS's own Candace Warren Longstreet Channel I for a conversation and then they will open up the program for questions to the audience. Dr. Wong Tri Shanalai is a director of research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. He received his PhD from the University of Virginia and prior to coming to MHS was an associate professor in the Department of History at Angelo State University in Texas. Before we begin the program, I would like to extend a special welcome to anyone who might be attending a virtual MHS program for the first time. If you are not familiar with MHS, we are the oldest historical society in America and have been collecting, preserving, publishing, and sharing our history since 1791. We hold an amazing collection of close to 14 million manuscript pages, including the papers of three of the first six US presidents. Um, we are still collecting today, uh, including a COVID-19 initiative designed to record people's experiences uh, during this unusual time and preserve a diverse sampling of firsthand accounts for future generations. In these days of social distancing, uh, we have also taken to hosting virtual events and we have online events planned for every week through July. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Megan Kate Nelson um, and uh, begin the program. Thank you. Nice to see you. Great to see you. Thank you. And I worked all the buttons correctly. So we're already off to a good start. Uh, so thank you so much uh, uh, to the MHS for hosting this event. Um, you know, the, the pandemic has created a lot of havoc and, and uh, crises for many people in many institutions. Um, but I can say, if I can speak for my fellow historians and authors with books out during this time, uh, it has been wonderful to see the way that institutions like the MHS have really shifted to virtual events um, and enabled us to still uh, talk to audiences about our work um, and the books that we have out. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you to Kid and to Sarah for the invitation um, to Gavin for uh, that lovely introduction. Uh, and before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you um, from the traditional lands of the Wampanoag peoples. So this is the book that I uh, have out right now, The Three-Cornered War, and it tells the story of the Civil War in the desert Southwest. Uh, most of the action takes place in New Mexico and Arizona, uh, parts of Texas and Colorado and Southern California. And this is a theater of the war that Civil War historians rarely talk about. Um, most Americans don't know about it all, even people who live in the region. Uh, and just a few years ago, I was one of those people. Uh, this is actually what brought me to the project because when I was doing research for my previous book on Civil War history, I discovered that there were these Civil War battles uh, that took place in New Mexico in 1862 and that Colorado gold miners had fought uh, in those battles to defend the West um, from Confederate invasion. And I was really surprised and because I had never heard about this at all. I'm from Colorado. Uh, growing up, I never heard about these battles uh, in school or at museums or during trips uh, that I went on with my family. So, you know, I think most historians feel this way that when you discover something uh, that you had not known before about the topic that you study, uh, it becomes a subject of great intrigue for you. And so, uh, really, I started this project um, with a couple questions in mind, but the major one was, you know, what happened? Uh, here in this region and why was it important? So the first major question is, is you know, why were the Union and the Confederacy in the West 
to begin with um, in the summer of 1861. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first, uh, as you might imagine, was money. Uh, it cost money to fight wars. And both the Union and the Confederacy were quite interested in uh, having control of the gold mines, uh, most of them in California, but also in the recently discovered gold mines of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so they wanted control of that. Also, uh, both the Union and the Confederacy wanted control of the Pacific ports um, all along that coastline from San Diego to Los Angeles to, to San Francisco. And this was actually even more dire um, and sort of more of interest to the Confederacy because already uh, by the summer of 1861, uh, the blockade had been ordered um, and was underway and they really foresaw the need for other outlets to ship their cotton um, to Europe and to Asia. Uh, they also thought, the Confederates also thought that if they could perhaps uh, take the West, for the Confederacy, uh, then they would be in control of that long border with Mexico, and perhaps they should, could negotiate an alliance that would give them access to the Gulf of California. Um, of course, it was in the vested interest of the Union to keep both the gold mines and the Pacific ports out of Confederate hands at this point in the war. Um, also, the, the third major reason that both the Union and the Confederacy were interested in the West uh, had to do with their visions of their nations and the future. Um, for the Union, uh, they saw the West as a future sort of land free of slavery and um, part of their empire of free labor. So a place where uh, farmers and ranchers and miners and merchants would work and make 40% uh, of the nation's land mass productive. Uh, for Southerners, um, they saw the West uh, in a different light. They saw its future as part of their expanding empire of slavery. Um, they had been arguing since 1848, since the bulk of this landmass had come into the United States after the Mexican-American War, they had been arguing for the expansion of slavery into these territories. And of course, this vision of the future during the war was rooted in those uh, debates in the 1850s, which really drove the nation apart um, and caused the Civil War. And so this was one of the interesting things to me. Um, you know, Civil War historians, it's like, uh, the, there's a firing on Fort Sumter and then no one ever talks about or thinks about the West anymore. You know, the, this debate over slavery and the territories brought the nation to war and then suddenly they didn't seem to care about it anymore. Um, but as I uh, show in the Three-Cornered War, that in fact was not the case, uh, that uh, there were people uh, in the Union and the Confederacy who were still thinking about the West and what it could do and what it would be um, for the Union and the Confederacy in the future. Um, and the Confederates thought they had a pretty good chance at taking the West um, during this period. Um, and that was because there were a lot of communities already living uh, in the West that had kind of uncertain loyalties. Um, first of all, miners had come to mining camps and diggings across the West from both the North, the South, the Midwest, um, many international miners as well. And, you know, it, they might want to throw their lot in with the Confederacy instead of the Union government. Uh, also, there was a substantial population of Mormons in Utah with their own militia who had just, uh, initiated their own rebellion against the federal government in the late 1850s. In addition uh, to those groups, uh, there were Native peoples, of course, across the entire West, um, hundreds of, um, of tribes who had different kinds of relationships with the federal government. Some had treaty arrangements, some did not, some uh, were in a constant state of warfare with the United States, and the Confederates thought that they might be able to create some alliances there. And finally, Hispano New Mexicans had been part of the United States for only a little over a decade, and uh, it was really unclear if they were going to go with the Union or, or see the possibilities in this new uh, Confederate nation. So with all of that in mind, uh, the Confederacy invaded New Mexico territory, which you can see from this map actually in the summer of 1861 encompassed what we now think of, or what we now know of as both New Mexico 
and Arizona. So it extended um, all the way from that far western Texas border all the way to the Rio Grande, or to the Colorado River, to the border with California. Um, so the Confederates thought if they invaded from Texas, all they had to do was march an army across southern New Mexico, uh, and boom, they would be in southern California. And from there, they could launch campaigns for the rest of the West and have access to those gold mines and those ports uh, that they so desperately wanted. Um, so to make this a reality, um, the, this invasion began in July of 1861. A Texan cavalry commander named John Robert Baylor, who I'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute, led a group of about 350 horsemen across the border, took the, and occupied the town of Mesilla, and then forced the surrender of Fort Fillmore and its 400 federal soldiers uh, in southern New Mexico territory. Uh, and then on August 1st, 1861, Baylor sat down and created the Confederate Territory of Arizona, which you can see actually on this map that I have for you on the slide, um, this military map from 1862, which actually shows the Confederacy extending all the way to the California border to the Colorado River. Um, and this, the Confederate Territory of Arizona had a little uh, different uh, shape than what we now know of as Arizona. Uh, and this was because um, Southern New Mexico territory was sort of widely known uh, to be in the possession of uh, Anglo secessionists who had come from the South, sort of migrated sort of straight across um, from the current states of the Confederacy to New Mexico. So that is why Baylor established those boundaries there. So Baylor was followed by an army of 3,000 Texans uh, under the leadership of Henry Hopkins Sibley, who had been um, formerly in the US military, had resigned to join the Confederacy. And they marched into the region uh, in November and December of 1861. And then they fought a series of battles against Union troops uh, in February and March of 1862. I'm not gonna go through all of these in the Three Cornered War. Uh, readers will kind of get a sense of how all of these battles unfolded on the ground. Uh, but I will say this, um, the Confederates in fact won uh, all of these battles, Valverde, Apache Canyon, Glorieta Pass, they marched all the way up the Rio Grande, took possession of Albuquerque and Santa Fe. They're the only Confederate army uh, to take and occupy a Union capital during the war. Now, throughout all of these uh, battles and through all of this marching, I think it's important to note that Apache and Navajo raiders were constantly hitting wagon trains and corrals and army posts and camps um, during this period and siphoning off uh, cattle and horses. And, uh, Officers on both sides were constantly um, reporting these raids uh, to their superiors and it really um, sort of disrupted uh, their campaigns on both sides. So this was a three cornered war kind of from the beginning. Um, as I said before, the Confederates won these battles. Um, to begin with, but once they got to Glorieta Pass, uh, which was north, which is northeast of Santa Fe, uh, they they won the battle there. But the Union troops were able to get behind their lines and destroy their wagon train, and without a wagon train um, to support them with supplies and weapons, uh, the, the Confederates could not possibly hope to continue their campaign um, for the larger West. And so they began their retreat uh, from April to July, 1862, uh, during which they marched 1,000 miles, more than 1,000 miles um, through desert landscapes in the spring and the summer. So one of the, the major themes of the book is how the high desert landscape kind of acted to shape uh, warfare in this region. So while the Confederates were retreating, uh, there was another army on the move, a Union army coming from California under the leadership of James Henry Carlton. Um, that army marched more than 800 miles. Uh, their goal was to get to the Rio Grande in time to help the Union army um, in New Mexico to fight the Confederates. Uh, they got there a little too late. Um, the Confederates were already back in Texas by the time they arrived. Um, but this moment is important because James Henry Carlton then took control um, of the Department of New Mexico. And he is the one who then, from the fall of 1862, to um, the fall of 1866 launched 
several campaigns uh, using Union Army soldiers against Mescalero Apaches, Chiricahua Apaches, and Navajos. And these were hard war campaigns. Um, uh, two of them, the Mescalero Apache campaign and the Navajo campaign led by Kit Carson, um, who is a major figure in the book and probably someone that you uh, think of more as part of kind of Western history as a scout or a pathfinder. Um, but he in fact was a colonel uh, and then a brigadier general in the Union Army. So uh, as a result of these campaigns, uh, Carlton was actually successful in forcing the surrender and the removal of Mescalero Apaches and Navajos uh, and uh, sending them to Bosque Redondo, which was a reservation that really was functionally a Union prison camp on the Pecos River in New Mexico, is about 400 miles away from the Navajo homeland. Um, and the story of these campaigns and um, the Navajo Long Walk to Bosque Redondo and their experiences uh, on that reservation in that prison camp um, are, really dominate the last third of the book uh, and really reinforce how the Union Army was acting um, in very specific ways on behalf of the Union government, um, not only to defend the West uh, from Confederate invasion, but then to take that land away from Native peoples uh, who consistently fought for their own sovereignty uh, and their own ownership of these lands. So. That's just a very brief uh, overview, overview of a lot of action. Um, and as you can probably tell, this is a complicated story with a lot of different communities involved. It took place over thousands of miles of Southwestern landscape and um, over seven years, uh, which is a longer chronology than most Civil War histories contain usually. Civil War histories sort of begin in 1861 and end in 65, but in the West, the war extended for a much longer period um, because in the West, the Civil War was an Indian War. So my challenge was how to tell this story with all of these different working parts and all of these different places in a way that would bring the reader along um, kind of uh, with these armies, with these people, um, soldiers and civilians and government officials um, who are kind of engaging in this struggle to control the West. Um, so as I was doing the initial research for the book, I was also reading a lot of fiction. And one of the things that I was reading, uh, some people may be surprised to hear, was Game of Thrones, um, which, uh, if many of you are familiar, then became a major t television show. And um, one of the markers of, of that novel and the television show uh, which also has a huge number of characters and a very uh, broad landscape, a uh, large landscape, um, is that George R. R. Martin uses multi-perspective narrative uh, to tell the story, which means that you uh, kind of go, go along with one character and then in the next chapter you jump to another and then another um, and the narrative moves chronologically, but you are kind of on the ground with particular people and you come back to them again in the future. And it creates this really nice um, combination of a kind of narrative tension and propulsion, but also uh, gives you a really good sense of people um, and the people involved and what their lives were like and what their communities were like on the ground. Um, so this is the strategy uh, that I decided to take, the narrative strategy in the Three-Cornered War. And uh, so hopefully for readers, it reads kind of more like a novel than a traditional history book for you. And, and what I'm hoping is that you'll finish it thinking it's a really compelling read, but and also that you learned something new about Civil War history. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you. There are nine major figures. Um, and I, I call them kind of protagonists, although they're all real life people. Uh, everything that I describe in the book actually happened and is documented uh, with various different kinds of sources, uh, which we can talk about later. Um, but I'm just going to introduce you to three of them now uh, before we turn to the discussion. So uh, I knew I had to begin with John Robert Baylor uh, because I knew I wanted to begin with that first invasion of New Mexico territory and the creation of the Confederate territory of Arizona. Uh, and 
when I read through the documents um, that the University of Texas holds uh, from John Baylor's family, his letters to his family, their letters to him, uh, I knew I had to start with him because he uh, is incredibly complicated, um, really evil guy, um, but all, an evil guy who also wrote love poetry to his wife. So uh, Baylor actually was not born in Texas. He was born in Kentucky, but he moved with his family to Texas in the 1840s. And they were really lured there by the offer of free land and the right to own slaves. And Baylor pretty quickly uh, got married, started a family. He was a farmer and then a rancher, and he enslaved men and women in both of those ventures. Uh, he studied uh, the law, passed the bar, was elected to the state legislature in Texas, uh, had designs on running for uh, the Texas governorship, uh, was an Indian agent for two years, which actually uh, did not make him more empathetic to Native peoples, but actually turned him against them. So much so that in 1860, he became the editor of a newspaper called The White Man uh, out of Weatherford, Texas, uh, which, as you might imagine from its title, uh, its sole purpose uh, was to print really salacious, uh, exaggerated accounts of Comanche raids on Anglo settlements in Texas and kind of whip up a frenzy against uh, Comanches. And uh, John Baylor joined uh, many kind of posses uh, in the kind of proto-Texas Ranger style uh, during this period and rode out against Comanche settlements uh, in West Texas. And so really by the spring of 1861, he was primed and ready uh, to join the Confederacy uh, to defend the right of secession, the right to own slaves and the right of white men to wrest lands away from native peoples. Um, by all accounts, he was a very capable um, and inspiring military leader, uh, but he was also ambitious and volatile and resentful and these characteristics really drive all of his action during the Civil War uh, in the West. So the second person I want to introduce you to is Juanita. Juanita never met Baylor. They never crossed paths, although several other protagonists in the book actually do. Um, Juanita was just a teenager when the war began. Uh, she was married to one of the most powerful headmen in Navajo society, Manuelito. And uh, I, because of that, I was able to track her movements because the Union Army was very interested in tracking Manuelito. So I was able to track her movements um, throughout this period from 1861 to 1868. Um, Juanita was also quite well known for her uh, talent and proficiency in weaving. And so this, and you can see this from this photograph, this is actually from 1874 from her visit uh, with a Navajo delegation with Manuelito um, to go meet um, with the president in Washington, DC. And she is pictured here with several of her own textiles, including the dress that she is wearing. And this allowed me, focusing on Juanita, allowed me to really tell the story, a, a couple of different stories. One of, of women in Navajo society and the power that they held um, in terms of culture and the economy, because they are the ones who raised the sheep um, and sheared and spun the wool and then wove blankets uh, and clothing, uh, not only for their own families and their own bands, but also uh, to trade in the very large extensive trade network uh, in New Mexico territory uh, and uh, within the, the Navajo homeland um, and along its borders. Um, and it also gave me uh, talking about and thinking about writing about Juanita also gave me the opportunity to write about civilians in the context of uh, the struggle for control of the West. Um, what was it like to be a civilian and a woman sort of in the middle of this hard war campaign um, that the Union uh, was initiating against Navajo peoples? And readers of the Three Cornered War will follow Juanita um, from the Navajo homeland um, on the long walk to Basque Redondo and then kind of uh, sit with her uh, at that prison camp um, for two years uh, while uh, the, the family and Manuelito kind of initiated a couple of, of different power plays and then finally were able to negotiate, uh, be part of the negotiating team 
that brought Navajos back to the homeland in 1868. Um, so Juanita's story, I think, is really the heart of the book. It is one of great suffering, uh, but also one of perseverance and survival. Now, much like uh, Juanita, Louisa Camby was an army wife. Um, it was her husband, uh, Colonel E.R.S. Camby, who organized all of the Union troops to defend New Mexico against uh, Sibley's invasion of Texans in 1861 and 1862. Uh, she had met him uh, in, actually in Indiana in the 1830s and they had gotten married after he graduated from West Point and she graduated um, from a female institute in Kentucky in 1839. And from that point on, for more than 20 years, uh, she traveled with him to most of his postings across the United States states. Uh, she was in California in 1850 during the statehood fight. Uh, they were both in Utah uh, during the Mormon War. And in 1860, they came to New Mexico Territory, uh, where her husband, who she actually called Richard, uh, he appears in most military records as Edward R.S. Camby. Uh, but I discovered when I went to the Filson Historical Society that everyone in the family called him Richard. So uh, that is how I refer to him in the book, um, because it's the, from her perspective, the ch most of the, the information about him. Um, so Richard was there to organize uh, campaigns against uh, Navajo peoples, including Manuelito, and then the Confederates invaded. Uh, when Richard went south to uh, take command at Fort Craig and to fight ultimately in the Battle of Valverde, uh, Louisa Camby stayed in Santa Fe, and she still stayed there when the Union Army abandoned the city as the Confederates marched northward. So she was there when the Confederates arrived and took the city and occupied it. Uh, she was also there in the wake of the Glorieta Pass uh, battle, and she was pretty much solely responsible for organizing the Anglo and Hispano women of Santa Fe to uh, get medical supplies together and food. And um, she helped the Confederate wounded in the wake of that battle. And for that, Confederate veterans always referred to her as the Angel of Santa Fe. Uh, so Louisa Camby gave me the opportunity to sort of tell the story, um, a kind of longer story of the US military in the West. Um, but also, uh, much like Juanita, she gave me uh, the opportunity to talk about women uh, in particular in the West, uh, their roles, the domestic roles that they played, the social roles that they played uh, in these Western towns and, and army garrisons, uh, and to really look at how the war uh, became a home front war in so many places across uh, battlefields and across the nation during the Civil War. And this has become, this is of increasing interest. There have been two uh, edited collections recently, one called Occupied Women um, and one I think called The Household War um, with really great essays by scholars about women who are in the same position as Louisa Camby. Um, so she uh, was one of the first people I identified um, as a major protagonist of the book. Um, she leaves kind of halfway through and you <laughs> don't see her again because she doesn't return, uh, but she plays a very major role uh, kind of in the first half of this book and the Union Confederate fight. So ultimately, you know, what do we gain from looking at uh, people like Baylor and Juanita and Louisa Camby and looking at the war from one of these unexpected places like this, the Jornada del Muerto, which is a huge stretch of desert in southern New Mexico territory. Um, well, I think a couple of things. I think it really shows us um, how the war in the far west was in fact a three-cornered war um, in a couple of ways, that it was a fight between the north, the south, and the west um, that was fought by Union and Confederate and Native peoples, uh, and um, that those battles were fought by Anglo and Hispano and Native soldiers. So that's one thing. Also, I think looking at the war from uh, this unexpected place shows us how the, the sort of idea that we have that the Union War was a just war um, is, is much more complicated than that because what becomes clear is that at the same moment that Union soldiers in the East are fighting for emancipation, Union soldiers in the West are fighting for native uh, 
in some cases, extermination and removal, and that those were actually part of the same project, this larger vision um, of the union's kind of empire of free labor, which necessitated uh, the eradication of native peoples and the taking of their lands. Um, so ultimately, I think uh, what the Three Cornered War shows uh, is that the Civil War was truly a national war, that it extended from the Atlantic to the Pacific, uh, that it involves multiple borders and multiple communities that we haven't really thought about before, uh, and that it was truly a continental conflict. So one of the things that has come up recently, um, and you know, historians are, we often think about the past, but uh, really um, a lot of the past uh, is always in our present, right? And so recently, the issue of Civil War monuments um, and memorials has become a very present uh, moment and, and part of a larger discussion of what it means um, to have monuments in public spaces, what they mean, uh, what they mean for the people who live in those um, communities. And you may have been wondering through this presentation um, whether New Mexico had any monuments to Civil War soldiers who fought there. And in fact, yes, uh, they do. And um, two examples of this are in Santa Fe. Uh, the first is a monument to Union soldiers. Uh, the money started to be raised for this a monument in kind of 1866-67, and it was ultimately finished in 1868. It sits right in the center of the, the Santa Fe Plaza, if any of you have been there. It's kind of one of the major, probably the major tourist attraction um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and the plaza itself, interestingly, uh, is uh, also a kind of monument to Union soldiers because Union soldiers built it uh, in the, um, the form that we know it today with the radial pathways kind of meeting at the center with this monument. Um, so the monument has, uh, as you can see, is an obelisk. It has four sides and on each one of these um, marble sides, uh, it has several engravings. Um, and the, two of them laud uh, the heroes of the Union Army who fell at Valverde, Glorieta Pass, uh, and then a smaller battle at Peralta. Uh, one of the other um, marble slabs just says, you know, from the grateful uh, citizens of Santa Fe, uh, may the Union be perpetual. And then there is this um, on the fourth side, to the heroes who have fallen in various battles with, and originally this said, with savage Indians in the territory of New Mexico. Um, in 1974, a, an American Indian movement activist uh, came up to the, the statue sort of dressed in, in, um, in construction clothing and chiseled out the word savage. And the city of Santa Fe chose to just leave that word chiseled out and there's a plaque that sort of explains that context and why uh, they chose to leave that space kind of empty um, and why the term savage. Uh, is uh, such a problematic term in this context. But this monument really does prove uh, that both Union soldiers and the people of Santa Fe believed um, that fights against the Confederates and fights against Native peoples were part of the Union cause. The other major uh, monument actually looks quite a lot like the Union soldier monument. Um, this is the Kit Carson monument, which was uh, built and dedicated uh, many years later in 1885. It was privately funded and then dedicated by the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, which is the major Union Soldiers Veterans Organization. Uh, so this sits in front of the U.S. Uh, courthouse in Santa Fe. It's a little bit off the plaza. Not a lot of people know about it, I think. It's a very subtle monument, but it is a monument to Kit Carson and his three roles as a pioneer, a pathfinder and a soldier, as you will see in here. And one of the other uh, kind of blocks uh, reads, he led the way. Um, so my view on these two monuments, um, well, first of all, my view on all of these monuments is that the local communities need to decide uh, what to do with them uh, and what is um, kind of most meaningful for them in terms of sharing public space and in, ter in terms of what that means for the community to make an argument about what it stands for. Um, 
And I also think that that, that discussion needs to include uh, Mescalero Apaches, Chiricahua Apaches, and Navajo peoples, um, because especially the Union Soldiers Monument, which sits in the plaza, sits right across um, uh, from an area where Navajo artisans sell their work every day. Uh, and so they have to look at that monument every day, which lauds Union soldiers for launching campaigns against them and uh, sending them to Bosque Redondo, which is a sort of major moment and um, kind of watershed moment in Navajo history. So uh, they should be involved in deciding what to do with these monuments. Of course, my personal uh, idea would be to, to turn both of them over to Navajo artists uh, to uh, do with them whatever they would like to do with them. Uh, if they would like to tear them down and use their materials to build something else, or if they would like to build something next to them uh, to engage uh, in that conversation or just reimagine that space in some other way. Um, but I know that, so Kid and I had discussed uh, this issue a little bit before uh, the event uh, when we were kind of thinking about how this event would go. And I know that uh, Kid who lived in Texas for many years and has been to Santa Fe several times has seen these monuments. Uh, so Kid, I'm wondering what you think about uh, these monuments, kind of seeing them again in this context. Thank you, Megan, for a great presentation. That was fabulous. And thank you for starting our conversation portion off with these, uh, this uh, timely discussion of the monuments there. Um, I've been to Santa Fe several times. It's a wonderful, beautiful place. And I, quite frankly, was surprised to find a monument to the Civil War in the middle of the town. Like you, I knew very little about the Civil War in the West. The Battle of Glorieta Pass, which you talk about, is billed as the westernmost battle of the American Civil War. Um, and so, it, and, and then to her, learn, learn about the history uh, behind the, the, the wording on these monuments and how it was chiseled off, uh, that, that's just, uh, it just proves the point of how complicated, even perhaps even more complicated, the war was in the West when we're dealing with multiple racial groups here. Um, in fact, race is a huge issue uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, could be more so than in the eastern parts of the war. You make a note about uh, the, how the United States recruited the, the first multiracial army to fight in the American Civil War during this campaign. I was struck by that. I hadn't thought about that before. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took place out in the far west. Yes. And I was also struck by the similarities between what Hispano soldiers faced and the discrimination that African-American soldiers mm -hmm. faced. One of your characters, John Clark, for example, doubts their effectiveness in battle. He, claim, he says, we must have Americans to fight against Americans. He doesn't even see them as Americans. And then, meanwhile, the descriptions that you talk about, by the way, how would you um, rate this book uh, if you were giving it a parental guidance uh, rating? Because there are some pretty savage yeah. scenes in here, mm -hmm. very much like Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but, but your description of some of the fighting between the Native Americans it, it, and, and then the fighting with the Confederates reminded me of the savage nature of the Second World War in the Pacific mm -hmm. versus the European theater. So races, such a huge part here. Mm -hmm. I was curious though about uh, two, two other groups that you talked about race-wise um, in this. Um, and, and one was um, the Armillo family uh, from uh, Santa Fe that uh, went with the Confederates. They sided with the Confederates in this fight uh, and then went with them. And I'm just curious to know more about how Hispanos uh, felt or fell on the issue of who to support, the United States or the Confederate States. Right. Well. Yes, that's a great question. And, and it's really interesting because I think Sibley, you know, at the part of the, the way that he convinced Jefferson Davis to actually let him kind of in, start this campaign and launch it uh, was the, he felt sure that Hispano New Mexicans were going to were going to throw their lot in with the Confederacy. I mean, he, he 
uh, was pretty confident about it because I think he thought that they were also suffering at the hands of the federal government, uh, that they had not wanted to necessarily enter the United States of America, that the, the border had just kind of leapt over them. And so uh, he thought that he could convince them. And actually he was relying quite heavily on the fact that he could recruit them because this was an army that needed to subsist itself uh, on the road. This was part of the plan. They were cut off from all their supply lines. So they, they thought that along the Rio Grande Valley, which is a very fertile valley full of farmers, um, that they could actually get foods, food that the Hispano New Mexicans would become their quartermasters in effect. Um, and that did not happen um, because uh, for a couple of reasons, um, one, Hispano New Mexicans, most Hispano New Mexicans did not uh, see the Confederate uh, kind of alliance as something that would necessarily help them. Um, there was already significant U.S. Army presence uh, in the region, and mostly uh, what Hispano communities needed from those soldiers was protection against native raiding. Um, Hispanos had been, um, you know, as part of, of Spanish uh, culture and then also Mexican culture. Um, they had been part of that whole um, fight with native peoples in the region and a sort of cycle of raiding and violence. Um, and they, I'm not, excuse me, sorry. Um, and they had, uh, been a part of all of that. And so they really relied on when US troops came in and built forts in the region, uh, they were providing a vital service uh, for Hispano communities, which before that had kind of relied on their own militias to ride out against uh, and also raid native and, uh, well, Navajo and Apache communities. Um, in, in, so this was a very long standing sort of enmity and uh, US troops had had been there for a while, kind of engaging in these fights with them. And so that was one thing. The other thing is that Sibley had completely either not known or had forgotten that Texans had tried to invade New Mexico before. Um, and uh, when it was in 1841, uh, when it was Northern Mexico, uh, and they, Texans believed that Santa Fe was actually part of their territory. And so they marched an army into Santa Fe. They were you know, it was a terrible march. They were not in good shape when they got there. They were easily defeated and then marched as prisoners of war to Mexico City. Uh, but there is a, a long memory of that event. And so the fact that this army of invasion was entirely made up of Texans uh, really undermined uh, Sibley's argument um, with most Hispano uh, New Mexicans that they should come uh, with the Confederacy, because they saw them mostly as Texans and not as Confederates. But um, the, yeah, the Armijo brothers were um, very wealthy merchants and uh, they were also slave owners. And this is also, slavery is part, had been part of this Hispano native raiding um, relationship and network um, for years and years. And so <clears throat> that was pretty well established. So the, the, the issue of slavery also and unfree labor in New Mexico is a very complicated uh, one, um, especially in light of the Civil War and in light of the Emancipation Proclamation, um, you know, passed in January of 1863. So um, that some Hispano New Mexicans uh, went with uh, New Mexicans, some Anglo New Mexicans uh, went with uh, the Confederacy, uh, but most uh, stayed with uh, the Union and either fought for the Union Army or supplied them with things or sold them um, goods, uh, which was the case for most Hispano farmers in the Rio Grande Valley actually hid all of their foodstuffs from or as much as they could from the Confederates and then turned around and sold it to the Union Army, which gave the Union Army a huge advantage. So, I mean, this point about the war in the West being so dependent on provisioning from the locals is fascinating. And, and, and that goes to the, these parallels I kept seeing between what you describe as the war in the, the far West here, mm -hmm. and then the war that's taking place closer to uh, the East Coast, right? So the Western theater, the traditional Western theater and the Eastern theater of war. And I'm looking at these Texans going into New Mexico saying they're going to survive by confiscating food. 
And I think of this um, debate that the United States government has, commanders have, about whether or not to confiscate anything at all from Confederate rebels mm -hmm. uh, during the war. And then the talk of uh, Ulysses Grant's Vicksburg campaign being possible only because he lived off the land, because mm -hmm. he saw that from Winfield Scott in Mexico. His lieutenant, William Tecumseh Sherman, does the same, incorporates that into his march to the sea. Mm -hmm. And in his march to the sea, Sherman's purpose there is also to crush the morale of the Confederacy, something that your characters do as well, the characters you describe do in their war against the Navajo. That is, the soldiers who are rushing into the Navajo territory to demonstrate their power as a way to crush the morale to get them to go to Bosque Redondo. Mm -hmm. So I kept seeing these parallels between these two styles, and it just seems like our our ideas that these, the invention of, you talked about hard war in, 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 in your introduction there, these ideas about hard war are not created by Scott or Grant or Sherman, but are already out there. People do this, and it just depends on the population they're fighting with. And in this case, we're talking about a Native American population. Exactly, yes. And, the, and the, these are parallel, but they're also happening more than a year in advance, right? The, so, so you mentioned before the, the multiracial army for the Union, the first New Mexico. Um, yeah, and I, and I should have mentioned that before in my kind of discussion of the campaigns overall. This is a really extraordinary army that can be put together. It was there were army regulars who had been posted in the frontier for years. Uh, there were Hispano New Mexicans who were volunteers and militia units that were attached. Uh, there were these Colorado gold miners in these small units that marched down um, from gold mines in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and then there were Ute and Pueblo scouts and spies. So this is a multiracial army. It is you know, not, as you noted, it shows some of the same tensions and racism as the armies uh, that would later kind of use um, black soldiers uh, in the Eastern theater, it kind of exhibits some of those same qualities. Um, a lot of distrust between soldiers, they're pretty much segregated into units of their Hispano units and then their Anglo units. Um, and most of the Hispano units have white officers, Anglo officers. And of course, Kit, and of course Kit Carson is the, the officer in command of the entire um, first New Mexico and is sort of admired by everyone. Um, but this is the first multiracial army in the field and a considerable number of those Hispano New Mexican soldiers then turned and re-enlisted to fight the campaigns against Mescalero, Apaches, and Chiricahuas and Navajos. Um, so those armies continued to be multiracial throughout the course uh, of uh, the war in this region um, in battles both against Confederates and against Native peoples. And then of course, you know, the, for the, it, the issue of foraging is really interesting, especially just as it's related to logistics, because one of the, the interesting things about this theater so you have these two, I mean, I know these, the numbers in these armies seem really small to people who study the Trans-Mississippi in the East, right? <clears throat> this is an army of 3,000 Texans. It's an army of about 4,500 Union soldiers. Like, that's just like, seems like nothing, right? You can't sustain a larger army. Right. You Well, and this is the thing, you couldn't sustain armies that big. This is why, you, these are the largest armies that the region has ever seen. And the reason for that is that you cannot subsist them. I mean, this is, you have to have, there have to be, there has to be so much planning, so much caching of food along the way. You have to know where all the water resources are and you have to be in control of those water resources in order to move that many people across that many miles. And it really took a toll on Sibley's men to make that march from San Antonio to El Paso and then El Paso all the way up. Uh, to Santa Fe. They were in really bad shape by the time they got there. Um, you know, they didn't have, they were eating half rations. They barely had any clothes, you know, and the weather, I mean, I think people think, oh, the weather in, in New Mexico is like lovely in the winter. It's actually not. Um, there are, as readers will find, it often is snowing on them when they're fighting um, and sleeting. And so they are very exposed and this takes a huge toll and this is one of the ways the landscape and the climate really shapes the action here and 
you know, Camby did not want to fight any kind of battle where he would, he would take the Confederate surrender because he didn't want prisoners of war that he would have to feed because he had more food, but he didn't have all the food. And it, that was going to run out if he had to actually help take care of more than, you know, 2,500 Confederate soldiers <laughs> by the end, right? Um, so foraging becomes kind of part of that larger story of how, and outside of the Rio Grande Valley, there was really nothing for them to forage. So that, that was a huge problem for them, um, for the Confederates kind of on the move and a real advantage for the Union. And then the hard war campaigns, you know, had always been a part of the U.S. Army's tactics against Native peoples that had always small contingents, you know, looking a little bit more like guerrilla warfare, like we would see in the Trans-Mississippi uh, and, and parts of Indian Territory, Missouri and Kansas. Um, that had, had been a part of uh, the U.S. Army's kind of tactical um, aim and kind of, you know, uh, their whole approach in the years before the war. And then they just integrated it seamlessly into these campaigns um, against uh, Mescaleros and Navajos in particular. They could never quite get Chiricahua Apaches kind of in, into any situation where they could make hard war um, kind of most intensive uh, for Chiricahuas. And that's why uh, the Apache Wars and the Southern uh, parts of this region continued on for 20 more years. Lasted the longest, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you bring up another important point here, and that is you say that there are nine characters in the book. I would say that the, the, the connecting character, the one constant, is the environment. Yes. It is such a fickle character. It's in here from the struggle for water, campaigning at high elevations, and the worms that decimate the corn crop at Bosque Redondo. I mean, the environment in the West is such a great challenge and, 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 and it's just so striking. You, you captured all of the, the beauty as well as the vastness of the West so well in this. And um, it's, it's a, it was a wonderful read. So Good. thank you. Um, I, I just want to say real quick before we go to another question, uh, to, to audience questions here, that what was also fascinating to me was um, about the distances in the West here mm -hmm. and how two of your characters decide, Baylor and Clark, that oh, they don't like how everything's going. So they're just going to hop back to Richmond or to Washington, D.C. as if <laughs> it was not, a nothing trip. Um, and it's just fascinating that they can think of doing this so quickly. Um, but we have some questions here, and I want to make sure we turn to them. Uh, the first question is from Kate Schuster. And this is uh, what she writes. Hi, I'm from New Mexico and my family there is famous for setting things on fire in Santa Fe. She gives us a link. I love the book. I manage the Teaching Hard History Project for the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I think it's really important to decenter the Eastern slash British colony centric version of history in K-12 classrooms. How can we do this better? Also, I grew up thinking that Kit Carson was a hero, as do most mm -hmm. people who go to school in New Mexico. Do you know him? I know he is attending practically all of our, uh, uh, well, anyway, yes, let's, let's, <laughs> I think that was uh, another portion of the question, but yes. Okay, we'll yes. On. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that I think is interesting when we um, kind of take our focus away from Eastern battlefields and from Washington and Richmond, uh, we get a different sort of view. And I think this is happening a lot in Civil War studies I don't, I, today. And I, I'm not sure that it's just, you know, a feature of, of studying the Far West. Um, but when you move kind of away from those more traditional places where the narrative is more about kind of white men and power structures and politics, um, then you start to see a different experience uh, emerge. And I think what's important is, and I know that in, in this book, you know, the major Native peoples who are engaged with the Union Army are Mescalero Apaches, Chiricahua Apaches, Navajos, and then also Pimas and Maricopas, who are, um, who kind of create, a, not really an alliance, but they have an agreement with James Henry Carleton um, outside of Tucson um, in Pima villages, uh, which is their homeland. And... I think what's important going forward is that 
scholars look at all Native peoples in the Far West and across the nation to see what their experiences were, because there was not, not one kind of Native America, right, that had all the same experience. Um, even the Mescalero Apaches and the Navajos who were living together at Bosque Redondo had different kinds of experiences. Um, so they had a very, the, the Native peoples in this book had a very intensive uh, relationship with the Union Army during this period and the Civil War for their communities becomes a very important watershed moment. And but it may not be the case uh, and, and was not the case for many other indigenous groups across the nation. Some had, um, you know, alliances uh, with Union troops like the Pimas Maricopas. Some had almost no contact at all. Um, some like the Cheyenne Arapaho and, um, and the Shoshone uh, in Utah had, Utah, Idaho had an experience that was, you know, we now understand as a massacre, um, Sand yeah. Creek and Bear Creek uh, in 1863 in, at Bear Creek and uh, 1864 at Sand Creek. Um, and that is a watershed moment in, in that community's history. Um, so I think it's important for scholars and for teachers going forward um, to, in order to decenter that what has become that traditional narrative of the Civil War that is so rooted on the Eastern battlefield and in the corridors of power. Um, when you start looking at people who were not, uh, not those groups, <laughs> but were uh, interacting uh, with Union troops and had connections um, to those power structures, but were responding to them or asserting, you know, their sovereignty or their power in different ways, I think that's a really good way to approach it. We have a lot of questions here. Um, oh, good. Let's see, here's another one. People uh, are, are, for obvious reasons, the monuments are, uh, are in the news. But um, this, uh, this is a question from Lindsay Peterson. And uh, she says, um, uh, Union Civil War memory in the Trans-Mississippi West is the subject of my dissertation. And I'm studying huh? the Santa Fe monuments you discussed, as well as others. So I'm curious, have you found evidence of local native peoples publicly contesting the narrative put forth by the Santa Fe monuments? You know, I haven't yet. I mean, the, I mean, I think there have been um, responses locally and, but I haven't, I've been trying to keep tabs recently on kind of, has there been some movement around these monuments? Because of course the Oñate, uh, monument came down um, elsewhere in New Mexico. Uh, that was a monument to one of the, to a conquistador, right? Um, so I would not be surprised if, if there was a kind of new protest upsurge around these two monuments or more conversation around them. But my perception, and Kid, maybe you have this perception also, there are a lot of kind of tourists and even people in New Mexico who don't really even that these monuments don't register as much. And I'm not exactly sure why, because they are very central. They're centrally located. And they're certainly, I mean, Kit Carson is not much as a, much of a kind of big figure in Santa Fe as he is in Taos, for example. Um, but I could see these two monuments becoming part of a larger conversation. Um, I don't know if that answers that question. Necessarily. I, I, I mean, it's not right. I mean, it, it's an unexpected place to see this, right? Maybe that's part of it. And also the, gov uh, the palace of the governor itself is mm -hmm. itself a monument of sorts. Right. And it sort of overshadows the whole plaza there in mm -hmm. Santa Fe. Uh, right. That's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah, because I think what, what was interesting to me, I took a, a three month research trip when I was doing the research for this book and I went to all of the sites uh, in New Mexico that are Civil War sites and there are a lot of them that have been preserved and are still kind of in as close to their um, kind of nature as possible with just sort of 150 years of, of natural change. Um, because they have not been, unlike Virginia, they haven't been paved over, there's not a strip mall right next to it. Um, they have been saved in summer national parks, summer state historic sites. And so it is actually possible, this is the great irony, I think, 
it's possible to go see almost every single site that I talk about in the book. You can't go see Valverde because it's on private land uh, that is owned by Ted Turner, of all people. Um, it's a cattle ranch. Uh, like yeah. a three hour film about it. I know, I know. So I'm sort of like, Ted Turner, why don't you turn Valverde over to the state government for preservation and visit? Um, so the sites are there for people to go and visit. And the, there's park staff there and historic site staff there to kind of interpret and they do a great job. Um, but no one knows that they're there. Like they're, they're not part of, they're not signed particularly well. They're not part of, I think people, when they go to the Southwest, they're maybe looking for something. They're not looking for Civil War history, right? <laughs> they're looking for Southwestern history. They might be looking for indigenous history, uh, but the Civil War is not entering that conversation in terms of markers like these or historic sites. I mean, Glorietta Pass is at Pecos National Historic Park. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it advertises the Native American connections to the mm -hmm. period. doesn't say anything about the Civil War battlefield. You have to go there to actually see. And you yeah. have to, yeah. And I, I don't know if, just very quickly, <clears throat> I don't know if this is still the case, but when I went there, you had to actually go to the Pecos yes. Historic Site thing, get a code to open the gate for Glorietta, and you had to find the gate and do the code, and sometimes the code wouldn't work, and then you'd have to get in there. And so, yeah, it, they don't make it very easy. Um, that was my experience as well, yes. Yeah, but the sites are there. The sites are there. Indeed. We have a whole lot of questions. We just have time for one more. Oh. And um, uh, I, maybe people will be able to contact you after this. If oh, they yeah, have additional absolutely. Questions. Yeah, at the end, I'll give everyone all my information. Very good. Well, the last question goes to uh, Kelvin Parnell. Okay. Uh, hello, I love the book. Near the end of the book, you write about Sherman's negotiations with the Navajo people. And one yeah. of their concerns was retrieving their families that had been enslaved and possibly traded into Mexico. Mm -hmm. You say Sherman guaranteed that the U.S. would take care of it. Did they actually? What was the outcome if the regarding retrieval, if any, regarding retrieval of enslaved natives outside the United States territorial borders? Yeah, no, they did not. Uh, the Union Army did not do a particularly good job of uh, Sometimes they would help um, if uh, Native peoples, particularly Navajos, came to them. Um, and this happened actually at Bosque Redondo a fair bit, that <clears throat> they would come to the, the soldiers who were posted at Fort Sumter and, or sorry, for, Fort Sumner. Sumner. Yeah. <laughs> um, Fort Sumner and, um, you know, sort of file kind of an official complaint and say, you know, this person who lives in this place, ha place has my child or has my relative um, and they had been stolen in a raid and they're in, living enslaved um, in this particular town or on this particular you know ranch and sometimes the army would go and try to negotiate to get um, the the people back and but sometimes they would not or they would try and fail um, there isn't a lot in the records about that quite frankly <clears throat> and New Mexico was still, um, for the most part, the legislature was under the control of Hispano New Mexicans, and many of them were Ricos, who were sort of the wealthier landowners, and many of them had enslaved Navajos and Apaches in their households. Um, and sometimes they were traded to Mexico, um, sometimes not. A lot of times they stayed within New Mexico territory, and so the U.S. Army could, in fact, uh, intervene in those cases, especially after the Emancipation Proclamation. But it was a little bit trickier for them the, than it would have been in the Eastern theater, for sure. That's another story to tell. That's another yes. book. That's a fascinating yes. story. Yes, yeah. If someone, I, yeah, someone else, any young scholars out there looking for a project. Yes. That's right. <laughs> oh. All right, Mary um, Gavin. Thank you very much for a great presentation. And Kid, thank you very much for a great conversation. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but Megan, if you would like to share your contact information or people can also contact uh, Sarah or me at uh, programs at masshist.org and we will pass it on to Megan. Um, also, if people are curious, I did actually copy all the Q and A's and pasted it into a Word document. So we do have a record of it and we can pass that along. Oh, wonderful. Um, so we are conscious, however, of, of people's time. So we want to thank everyone for uh, being able to join us. Uh, hope you will buy a copy of this book. Um, as always, uh, we encourage you to support a locally owned bookstore. Um, the, 
uh, local bookstore that is closest to the Mass Historical Society. It's called Trident Books. Uh, they have the book in stock. Uh, there's a link that you can copy down if you can write really quickly, um, and uh, or you can just Google Trident Books um, and uh, order it through that. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the program. Um, and if you are able to support the Massachusetts Historical Society, we hope you'll support our, our work. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a great uh, rest of their evening. Yes, thank you all so much for, for coming. And if you wanna contact me, you can just go to my website, which is very easy. It's www.megancatenelson.com.